All right, you guys ready to go live? I'm live. Sure. Yeah. Oh, Stephen already hit the thing. All right. Thanks for checking out Museum Ship Mafia. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. Tonight we got another episode, live crossover broadcast episode for you. And let's see. All right. Yeah, everyone's all, all three of us uh, checked in. We've got John Epp, curator of the USS Slater out of Albany, New York. Uh, YouTube channel. If you guys need to check out the USS Slater, make sure you search for the USS, USS Slater. And then, of course, we've got Shane Stevenson, the curator, and Stephen Tedesco, the educational director from the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. To check out their YouTube channel, make sure you guys search for the Buffalo Naval Park, buffalonavalpark.org. Uh, let's see. We got a whole bunch of people checking in tonight. I see Hoist the Jack, Ed Webster, Eric. If you guys can let us know how we sound. Oh, and there's Rob from Rocky Mountain Life Prox, uh, Prospecting. Rob, good to see you. Uh, let us know how we sound. John Epp, how are you doing this evening? Uh, I am even better now that we're back together. <laughs> yeah, it has been a while. Um, great to hear. Actually, it's uh, what has it been? About not quite two months since we've done a live broadcast. Is that correct? I, guess. I have no idea. It was sometime yeah. in August, wasn't it? Yeah, it's I, 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 I think it was. And then, uh, of course, like I said a few moments ago, we've got Shane and Stephen from the Buffalo Naval Park. You guys settled in, ready to go? Absolutely, sir. All right. Fantastic. Well, tonight, for those of you that aren't aware, I want to start off with John Epp over at the USS Slater because the last time <laughs> we did a live broadcast, they had 650 subscribers to the YouTube channel. Now, as of tonight... They are at 1,000, well, what I saw was 1,610. Uh, John, why don't, you, why don't you give us a clue? How did you guys jump 1,000 subscribers in such a short amount of time? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, for the end of summer into September, our engineers, every Monday, they were preparing to run our one of our eight-cylinder service generators. Um, it's worked for uh, many years. Uh, we have not run it in two years since the 2020 dry dock. So it was just to exercise and make sure everything was working, fix any leaks. Uh, so we made a video on that. I don't, I don't know. It's like 15 minutes long, something like that. Uh, it was two weeks ago. And I think we're up to just over 70,000 views right now. And we've doubled our subscriber base just by that video. <laughs> oh, and we no. are now monetized. So that's cool. Hey. Yeah. Great. Oh wait! So not only not only did you hit a thousand subscribers, but you guys hit the four thousand hours of watch time that's required. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now let's hope what you, you just get that pin number, and you could do that second. That's where we kind of stuck. Uh, we're kind of stuck right now in that. But yeah, how did that video hit seventy thousand views? That like, did you partner with anybody or? or no. How did you... It was literally we just uploaded it, and within. Within 24 hours, it was something like 10 or 15,000 views. So yeah. something happened. Uh, the YouTube algorithm must have just been like, hey, we like you today. So there you go. Um, but people are obsessed with engines and ship engineering. So I, I think that's probably the main reason it took off. Have you in and, and for those of you that <clears throat> haven't seen it. Uh, or for those of you that don't regularly visit the USS Slater YouTube channel, you really should check it out because they do a lot of behind the scenes maintenance videos, among other things. Um, Another one just went up a couple hours ago. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. See, now that one I, I wasn't aware of. But this particular video, and, and like John said a few moments ago, you know, the YouTube algorithm, it's a mystery to all of us at times. But when the YouTube algorithm grabs a video, and I've had the algorithm grab a couple of my videos, and then they just skyrocket. And you realize, like, wow, I don't know what it, – it's a mystery. But at the same time, if you watch this video, go to the USS Slater. They did an engine startup video, what, that was about a month about two ago? Weeks ago. Um, two I, weeks I ago. Should, I need to make it clear. This is not the propulsion engines. This is simply the engine that ran electricity on board. So well, while it is and, still and, an engine – it's not yeah. well, and it's, we'll we'll get to that in a second, but okay. um, but it I thought the way that you guys filmed it 
was very, very interesting because, well, first of all, let's give credit. Who, who actually recorded that video? James Miles. He's one of our newer volunteers, early thirties. Um, we put out, uh, basically a help wanted on our Facebook page about a year ago, like end of August of 2020. Help. You just yeah, looking for uh, volunteers because we were down to one engineer, one volunteer engineer. So we're like, Mike needs friends. Um, please come on down, be friends with Mike. We need engineers. We had a bunch of people come down. So he's been doing it for a year now. His entire thing is he climbs under all the machinery down into the bilges and just scrapes our bilges and cleans it. It's the biggest restoration work we have going on right now. Most important restoration work because ships rust from the inside out generally. So um, he's been doing that. And then he started doing the uh, work flogs. I want to say in January or February. And he's uh, mainly responsible for the success of our YouTube channel right now. Um, well, I, and what I wanted to get at when you talk about the success. Or, wait, so he's been doing these videos since January? <clears throat> yeah. yeah the, so the work vlog videos, that's all him. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. And so he took, he takes you through almost from the, the time he flips the lights on to all the steps that needed to occur. At one point, he's even changing a light bulb uh, in the engineering <laughs> yeah. space. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I found that fascinating. And I'm sure that's what a lot of, you know, engineering geeks like me, uh, gearheads, you know, and anyone that loves engine startup videos, that's probably what they found most interesting about it is because he takes you step by step, almost like what a day in the life is of what it takes to get this engine started. And you said a few moments ago that, okay, it's not one of the primary propulsion engines, but it's a pretty big engine. It is. It's an eight cylinder. Um, speaking of propulsion engines, technically they two of them have been quote unquote turned on within the past 20 years um in the early 2000s they were able to turn one over through the air and they also wear to hand crank one uh what's pretty cool is the slater is at a point where we don't have many restoration projects going on anymore after steering is probably the last one after that we are considering going down into our b1 engineering space and possibly restoring that to what the other engine rooms look like. So that is going to be very interesting because right now it's just grease and oil hasn't been touched since the eighties. Everything is still in Greek. So uh, if people are really into engineering, uh, getting it on film of a start to end, that's going to be a lot of fun. We haven't committed to yeah. it yet, but it's a possibility. I think it could be a lesson, you know, the level of success that you guys are having with this video. I think it could be a lesson to other museum ships out there, which is obviously people will find the history fascinating. They'll find, you know, general drone video overhead of the ship fascinating. But when you talk about the actual operation of something as big as an engine or even just the restoration of an engine, that in and of itself yeah. can fascinate people for hours. Mm -hmm. And the engine, we have engine room tours on the ship. It's not part of the main tour. It's, it's an add on tour for like six bucks. And mm -hmm. uh, we've been pushing that a lot the past two seasons and people love it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Now, uh, Buffalo Naval Park, when are you guys going to be starting an engine? Uh, yeah, I mean, it would be nice <laughs> to get some uh, emergency diesels going, some of our straight eights or whatever, you know, but uh, yeah, that we're not to that point yet. But um... Now, is that answer an indication of how big a deal this was that the Slater was able to pull off to start one of these engines? I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, we don't know what really the last, it, it, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, it really is a difficult endeavor to get something like that running. Yeah. And, you know, as you, as you, as you mentioned, like the gearheads and stuff like, but for people that worked on that uh, engine uh, originally, you know, those people are going away. We, we always talk about our croaker, you know, trying to restore one of our croaker engines. And it's just like, you know, people that served aboard 
uh, even in through the 60s and into the late 60s, they're just kind of going away. So they might have the inherent knowledge, but we'd have to bring some people on with like a clean slate mm -hmm. and really begin that step by step because they're learning a new relatively, you know, now it's an yeah. engine's an engine. And it depends, like the Little Rock doesn't, wouldn't be able to start at all, start off with nothing. Oh, but yeah. She's I mean, got, she was cannibalized by the Navy when um she was given to us so yeah. there's you know we're lucky we get in the lights on <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh you know our tur you know the turbines have been taken you know some of the reduction gears have been kind of you know messed with and not by us but um mm -hmm. you know the acdc uh for her power panels are just missing stuff like that well, and there's another example of how hard it is to get something like this running. If it's been cannibalized over the decades and it's just been sitting, uh, it's not like you can go to Napa or AutoZone and get replacement parts. If, if something's been cannibalized, chances are nine times out of 10, you're never going to get those parts back. Which is essentially why and if you were able, able to get in the first place. Yeah. Say that again. Which is essentially why the Navy took them when they gave us the Little Rock, because they can't replace these parts. Yeah. And and if you do get some some of these parts back, are they serviceable? Can they be used to start the engine again? Probably not. So what the Slater pulled off in this video is pretty amazing. And I think you're getting the recognition for it. I think, like you said a few moments ago, it's got 70,000 views. It's put you over the 1,000 subscriber mark. So I say congratulations. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> Well done. Thank you. Awesome thank you. Thank you. Awesome yeah, awesome and job. now you're doing. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just, yeah, go. Uh, and now you're doing videos daily, right? As you had mentioned. No, you know, no, 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 no. Weekly. Uh, I, I I do my uh, deck log video every week, and then the work vlog is typically every week as well. So it's it's usually one to two videos a week we do. Oh, okay. I thought I was seeing, you know, daily. Okay, forget it. I'm sorry. One thing we did, we did do a. Um, uh, a YouTube short. Uh, we were uh, we repainted depth charges and we just reloaded it yes. into our racks. Within five minutes, we were at fifteen hundred views on that. So that might be yeah, a, a new avenue. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's an interesting part that depth charge loading part where it kind of got hung up and then you had to like slam it home in the rack. Of course, it's yeah. not live, but at, I'm going well. <laughs> Again, that's another pretty good video. I hope that one takes off too. Uh, and then you guys in another week or two have another big event coming up. Is that correct? Who's that? Me? Slater? Of course. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying. Am I still like spinning on your, my background? No, oh, it does. Yeah. It flips from the Slater to the, to the, probably one of the captains or something, but it's not spinning. No, oh. you can see the Slater. Oh, okay. It's just black yeah. screen. I'm on. Okay um oh yeah no, i think you've landed at this point so you're good uh, okay good uh tomorrow is actually so tomorrow's the uh, navy birthday yes. uh so we'll have a little ceremony at the ship for that next thursday is our annual fundraiser so that's gonna be cool we have not i don't think we've finalized if we're going to be taking video of that yet um we'll see now is that like an in-person like you uh, did you yes fundraise? okay so it's an in-person yep. with it's a uh, it's a fundraiser. Uh, we'll have Park Stevenson. We'll, we'll be there. Uh, he'll be doing a presentation on on uh, discovering the Samuel B. Roberts in June, uh, and then we'll have one other speaker as well. Nice. Okay. And the Buffalo Naval Park. Okay, so we covered the Slater. What's been exciting with them? What's the latest and greatest with you guys? Well, you know, we got back from the conference, and it was just right, you know, going right to the wall again. Steven's been doing a lot with encampments. If he wants to cover that, I can cover what's been going on with the ships. Uh, but I'll, if you want to. Yeah, it's just kind of been nonstop since we got back. I don't know if I even unpacked all my suitcase, to be honest with you. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, the encampments are a big part of like what we do here. Um, we had 130 kids or 130 campers, I should say, last weekend. And this weekend we have 220. So it takes up. A really good chunk of my time in the spring and the fall um, where I'm just kind of running around like crazy trying to organize this but I mean I have a lot of help with the, the guy that helps me run it Andrew Turner has been um, Wait, you guys have 200 people sleeping on the ship at once yeah wow we cap ours at Wait. 50 and I'm like holy that's a lot 
<laughs> sleeping on which ship? Which ship do you on the are you hosting these? They all sleep on the Kroger. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the Little right, Rock. Uh, they all sleep on the on Little the Rock. Floor. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, we we have anywhere. I mean, a couple weeks ago, we had 32. Right. So, I mean, it really depends on the popularity of the weekend for whatever reason. Mid October, it's just everyone like. Let's go sleep on the Little Rock. Yeah. This weekend, yeah, we have 220. Next weekend, we have 150. Um, I mean, I think to break even with the staff, because I mean, how big is the staff? 12 or something? Or? No, we're. Um, it depends. And again, it depends on the weekend. I can cut staff. Oh, yeah. Which, okay. unfortunately, I hate to do, but sometimes you have to do um, when there's only 30 campers. Um, but I have about seven staff that we work with. And. Um, yeah, it's about 100 people we like to get in order to kind of break even there. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, so let, let me ask you this, because I haven't really talked to you guys about this before, but let's just say hypothetically, let me pick one of the, let's say Michael Phillips wants to come to Buffalo and wants to stay on board the Little Rock. Can somebody like Michael just show up and, and, and pay a fee and say, I want to spend the night on the Little Rock? So the way the encampments work is that you gotta have a kid <laughs> um, for the encampment. So it's not just Boy Scouts. I mean, it, the majority of it is Boy Scouts, uh, Girl Scouts. Um, sorry, I should say Scouts of America um, and Girl Scouts. Um, but we do have families. I had a family of four um, this past weekend that came, didn't know anybody. Um, they just signed up, came, had a great time. Um, but unfortunately, we did not offer it to just anybody. Right now, we just offer it to um, families. So I did have one guy. He's like, oh, me and my son want to you know, sleep on board. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That's fine. You guys can sign up. He's like, I should say my son is in his 30s. <laughs> I'm like, well, I, well, actually, no, sorry. But um, it's not something we can't do. It's just right now we focus on the encampments. And um, that that is kind of, you know, it's a, it's a family or a scouting troop or youth group or wh whoever really wants to come, but it is like a kid family oriented type thing. Yeah. We so do, some, uh, somebody like me who does not have kids, I'm, I'm out of luck. Let's no, let's caveat that. I mean, you could borrow one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. oh yeah. Will you rent one of your kids out? And yeah. if so, uh, for how much? Well, let's, yeah, let's caveat though, because you know, where there's the difference between encampments and, for volunteers, they can stay on board. Uh, okay. You know, okay. We, we might have an admiral visit, which we have had in the past. We offer that. Uh, we have mm -hmm. old salts that are not volunteering, but they're visiting the ship for the first time since 1971. We allow them to stay on board. Uh, you know, we just last week we had Chief Selecti um, initiation going on, so they slept on board. So. You know, for Ken, for when you come and do your dirtiest jobs, uh, you can stay on board. Yeah, yes. you can absolutely stay on board. Um, yeah, I mean, we just don't offer it to the general like the public. the general public. Um, is it something that we could do? Absolutely. Um, you know, we get people talking about it all the time. Or we, I'll talk about the encampments, and they'll be like, oh, you know, I want to do that. And they're like, yeah, I mean, have a kid, I guess. <laughs> uh, well, that and was Texas. Yeah, well, I wanted to. Oh, yeah, wow. hello, Texas. Battleship you Texas. Guys. We're gonna we're gonna be talking about the Texas in a little bit. Um, although, <clears throat> love that. I love, love, love the Cobia. Battleship Texas. Who who's checking in tonight from the Battleship Texas? Because I've tried to get in touch with you guys, and I hear nothing but crickets. And <laughs> and if you if you think I'm being a little harsh, maybe I'm not being harsh enough. I I really <laughs> want to talk to. I really want to talk to somebody Travis. from the Battleship Texas. Travis that, is the guy to talk to. Travis is the Travis? guy to talk to. Yeah. All right. Because, uh, you know, we're going to be digging in a little bit uh, later on, just so everyone's aware. You know, I want to ask Shane and Steven what their experience was at the Hinsa event in, in Hawaii. And at the same time, as I understand it, the Battleship Texas gave a pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting presentation on what's going on in the dry dock. And so we're going to be kind of gossiping about the Battleship Texas later on. Um, so whoever is checking in from the Texas, yeah, all the best. Uh, I could drop I could us a line. Travis, I could get Travis's information though. Uh, for say updates on the Sullivans, 
Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, the uh, our naval marine architect has been chosen. Uh, to not many people's surprise, it's Joe Lombardi and his company who has worked with the Texas. He worked with the Slater. He worked with the Laffey. Uh, he, he actually, with us too. yeah, he worked with us about 21 years ago or so. Uh, and so he's probably going to be coming. They're just they're just putting the final nails in the uh, well, coffin's not the right way of saying it, but they're putting the final no, nails not. on the contract and, um, you know, just working it, things out with the city and things, just some final things. He'll be here hopefully in November. Uh, and so we're, we're working on our winter plan right now of uh, keeping the ship heated to at least four, at least 40 degrees in all the spaces and um, getting the, you know, the right amount of bubblers uh, for the winter. Uh, we've, our volunteer group has you know, really been growing, which has been fabulous. Uh, we've had a lot of work done, a lot of painting, uh, you know, a lot of work on the gun director platform, uh, the Mark, uh, Mark 57 gun director platform on the aft superstructure trying to seal those up so there's no water incursion that goes down from the O2 level all the way down to, uh, say, the main deck or even first platform. Uh, and then, of course, we're also having a lot of work done. We've got our working party from the, uh, the fall working party from the Little Rock guys. So there's about eight guys here now this week that are doing some work, uh, and that's fabulous. You know, they're working in the flag bags and the signal uh, area getting those uh, painted and touched up, uh, you know, working on little projects of with rust and corrosion, you know, like at door frames and things like that. So it's, it's, you know, we got a lot going on here too. It's, it's... Okay. You guys are in Buffalo. I'm here in Minneapolis. The temperatures in both places are right around the fifties, right? At least that's what it is here in Minneapolis. Yeah. It's cold. Where do you, draw the line temperature wise weather wise when it comes to the kind of maintenance you're just talking about i'm, I'm actually surprised this kind of stuff's still going on i mean we do maintenance all year round but... internally yeah we'll do maintenance. today was 70 degrees so i think oh really we, okay yeah so i think we kind of said today might be the last day if we want to get some paint on to some areas if we want to get some uh you know uh get some paint on a deck you know, do some scraping of some corrosion. Uh, they worked on it all. They worked on it all day today, knowing it would probably be the last real, real, real nice day. Uh, out uh, in, internally, uh, since all of our ships do not have internal heat throughout the whole ship, uh, we have spaces that have heat, uh, but not the whole ship. Uh, but okay. hopefully, with the Sullivans this year and the plan, the whole, uh, you know first platform, second platform, all of those areas below the main deck will be heated. And then we will be able to continue to do work. Cause we do a little work, as you said, like last, you know, but, um, you know, now if we have access to the whole ship at 43 degrees, 44 degrees, something like that, you know, that would, that will really be helpful to continue the volunteer projects, uh, throughout the winter, keep that momentum going. Got it. Uh, let's. I'm. I'm really curious. So let's let's jump into your trip. Your your trip to the Hinsa conference. Uh, for those of you that don't know, and I don't know how you wouldn't, uh, Shane and Stephen did a cross country road trip. Uh, their final destination or ultimate destination was the Hinsa conference in Hawaii. But along the way, they hit various places like the Edson the uh let's see the chicago uh museum of science and industry i was able to meet up with these guys there uh, you that was we, met up with, we met howie mandel in chicago it was really cool yeah <laughs> look at that i love that you know we're yeah. all look at so you can never say that we don't pay attention uh because look at our captivated looks you know? I know. Like we, we are yeah. very, and i'm wearing my encampment shirt <laughs> oh yeah you are wearing yeah encampment shirt. look at that that's cool so yeah so we you're were, you're, you're to what you were saying you're you're either captivated or extremely irritated i don't know which one it was <laughs> but uh i had a lot of fun meeting you guys there of course we were able to tour the u505 that was fascinating what and then and then 
And then on from there, you guys went to Iowa. Um, San Francisco. Spent a lot of time in uh, San Francisco. Uh, I think maybe, what, a day and a half, two days in San Francisco. Before then, yeah. you went on to Hawaii. So uh, why don't you guys just kind of jump in and tell us what the Hinsa Conference was all about, uh, what you learned, if anything surprised you, uh, you know, and I'll just leave that up to you guys. Uh, I did learn where the middle of nowhere USA is from Shanna. She described that to me, that she grew up near the uh, official middle of nowhere USA. Oh, yeah, Montana. Yeah. And I, so, you know, it, it, for, for Stephen, he was, you know, I had met some of these people at the previous two conferences. For Stephen, you know, he really ingratiated and got to know people, Shanna and Dan and, uh, you know, many other yeah, um, and, and you know Ryan and Libby and uh, you know so there was a nice group of people uh, that we mingled with and Stephen was meeting uh, and he just got right in there and yeah was, so um, the boys from Salem uh, great yeah. group of guys there um, and yeah, Paul we, met them shortly after we did. yeah Paul was there like a couple <laughs> no. went to the Salem two days after we were there. there a couple days later. Um, but yeah, it was great. I mean, the networking part, I think, was probably my favorite part of um, being at that conference and getting to know people, um, you know, because then you do the conference during the day and then at night you grab food or whatever, and um, you really get to talk about work then, right? Like you're sitting and listening to presentations, which are great, but then you really get to talk about what do you guys do? What works for you? What, what doesn't work for you? and I mean, I came home with a wealth of knowledge just that I could, you know, bring back here to the Naval Park, um, which is what I expected. And and it was great. Uh, I mean, just amazing people that I got to meet. Um, yeah. And it was, uh, I'm just kind of reviewing some of the comments. Grout Museum, absolutely, uh, Sam. Oh, we should, let's go uh, in order. So we'll go, we went to. It would do, look at the last one from Hoist. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the video, yeah. Well, maybe one day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, the Edson. Right? Yeah. So we went to the USS Edson, which was our first stop, which seems like forever ago. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah. the Edson was great. Um, beautiful ship. Um, they, the way they do it is, is really well. And, uh, they paid you guys a big compliment, John, because I asked them, I was like, oh, you guys have a great volunteer um oh. set up here i was like how do you guys do it and he's like oh you have to ask this later we just follow what they do so, so, and we're the, beginning to do it here, so the edson was uh big in the early years of the slater's restoration because the slater was more right up alongside the edson in new york city for four years mm -hmm. so a lot oh, of their oh, crew yeah. came over and uh did all the hard work nice um bill randall was the guy that gave us the tour yeah. uh he was an amazing guy um I don't know. We were there for what three hours, probably. Yeah, amazing. probably. Yeah. Um, Again, it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does feel like forever ago. Um, but the Edson was great. I mean, beautiful ship, a beautiful museum ship too. The way they have everything set up and uh, the Twilight Zone. One of the episodes of the Twilight Zone was filmed there, so that was yeah, pretty cool. The thirty, um, the thirty-three fathom grave, I think it's called. Yeah, that was, and I watched that immediately. Like, yeah, they and what was interesting that I, I hope that they. Uh, take advantage of was they were getting ready for their Halloween like so it was like spiders everywhere and I mean like fake spiders and spider webs but one of the spaces they have is their 9-11 compartment that was a command center during 9-11 because they were in New York City on 9-11 and it would be really nice to tell that story uh, incorporated into the ship's history uh, wait, wait 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 a second the Edson was at 9-11 was in New York City. Intrepid. Yeah, it was in, no it kidding. Was, it was in New York City for the first, you know, years of her museum ship existence. And then they wanted to deaccession her or something happened. And so the Navy took it back. And then after about, my God, it must have been six or seven years, it finally ended up in Saginaw or Bay City. How did it get from New York City to Saginaw? What did they do? Go through the. Um... Put on a flatbed. <laughs> oh yeah, flatbed. Is that what it was? I, uh, <laughs> I like that we have this banter now. Though. I know it's episode great. three. I I don't like it at all. 
<laughs> no, the same way that uh, the ships came. Let's get rid of John right now. <laughs> the same way that the ships came to Buffalo through the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, Is that what it was? Uh, okay. Welland Canal, Lake Erie, and then they're just heading up. Um, and I yeah. So until you guys had visited the Edson, I wasn't familiar with it. So your road trip, which <laughs> I thought was kind of a lark, I guess, to, you know, also all of a sudden brought something like the Edson to my attention that I, I just plain old wasn't familiar with. So what was that like to visit? Yeah, it is, it is Stephen had said, you know, it was interesting from our perspective, because that's a Forrest Sherman class, we have a you know, I had not been on another, uh, a different class of uh, destroyer. So just seeing those updated changes, ours was about 15 years earlier than the Edson. So you incorporate all of those changes that we didn't have in the Fletcher, uh, most notably their five inch 54 for me, which was auto loaded. So they could fire, I think he said 30 rounds a minute, or was it 30 <laughs> rounds a minute? Maybe. And then, you know, just their service, because it was constructed in 58, they were much more involved with Vietnam. Uh, you know, we were kind of out of it by that time. So uh, just the layout of the interior spaces was interesting. She was a little bit, her beam is a little bit bigger, but 45 it's feet. 45. Yeah. So, but it seems so much more airy, didn't it? Like, it really it, it, it seemed it like, you know, compared to ours, you could tell that they've learned from the Fletcher and even though the Fletcher is the best class of destroyers. And the, the first part of the video <laughs> is up on our YouTube page. And we actually talk about that in um, mm -hmm. part one of that. Um, yeah. Wow, I can't even talk. The Edson video is up, the first part of the Edson video. So we do talk about the beam in that. Yeah. And so it's just seemed, it just seemed much more larger than just six extra feet wide at the beam. I mean, it, you know, just because of the layout. Right there, their uh, mess deck was set up differently. We did get to tour some of the spaces, uh, you know, the engine space. I, I think we did a uh, we did aft steering, which was cool because they have two rudders. Fletchers only have one, so we had the two uh, stations, uh, and that was unique. That was cool for me to see, for me and for us to see. Uh, so yeah, we um, and then we talked, of course, about like maintenance and what they do and uh how they can do it and you know certainly the weather is very similar to all all of our areas uh, minnesota albany us you know them up in bay city uh so yeah it's you know and they have a very active river there i think there's even lake freighters that go by uh kind of similar to us but they might have a little more lake freighter that goes by so you know, they have to worry about things like wakes and things like that, right, that they talk about. Um, yeah, they did talk. I don't know if they talked about it in the video at all, but they did talk about how they almost got knocked over. They were, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the ship itself, but they were on the ship and a wake hit it. And yeah, they were like on the scaffold yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's all, again, different challenges. <laughs> uh, I, I, I know we can spend a lot of time going through all of this, but, uh, you know. Well, I mean, and then. So let, let's go on from the Edson then, and then immediately the, uh, from one extreme to the other, you're talking about the Edson, you know, in a river with wakes going by. Now all of a sudden you're talking about a German U-boat in the middle of a beautiful, fantastic museum. So yeah. this was stop number two. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. I love the way that it was indoors. I wish we could do something like that for Sullivan's. Like how cool would that be? I know you had talked about that almost immediately. Stephen had said, wouldn't this be interesting to do with the Sullivan's? And it totally would be because look at all that space. If everyone's looking at the picture, look at all that artifact space, all of that exhibit space that you can build right in. And that leads you to the entrance. So you have everything you need by the time you walk uh, through the pressure hall right into uh the sub and it, it was just i mean it was just yeah it was i was we were blown away by it yeah it's a, it's a pretty me uh amazing display john if i'm if i'm not mistaken you've never been there before is that correct no i haven't but i'm looking at those torpedoes and <laughs> yeah uh they also have i know it's right out of frame but they also have hanging 
Yeah, let me see if I can pull that up. One of their forward torpedo tubes. So it's like I'll just come out and they must have, you know, obviously really strong fishing line or something that's clear that you can't really see. So it's just kind of like hanging there right forward of the torpedo tube. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it just was an amazing thing that something you can do indoors. So they really take advantage of the indoor, you know, you could just plop a ship indoors, but they've got the lighting. As you can see, it looks like water. So when they constructed this and they planned this out, they really planned it. So to take advantage of things like the torpedo coming out that you probably couldn't have to the same effect if she was sitting in water. I think, although it's well, not a it. very yeah, big something. picture. Yeah. Um, ironically, I actually took a look at how they had this displayed. You can kind of see one of the cables on the right-hand side. It is a pretty, pretty hefty cable. I, I, and if I'm not mistaken, a torpedo like this easily weighed, if not a ton and a half, you know, at least one ton. Uh, if, if any of you guys in the comments know, please let me know what a, a German uh german torpedo weighs because it's 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 pretty impressive when you're walking under it yeah yeah um uh, i'm just again looking at some of the questions um yeah yeah well yeah. and uh and then from the 505 then you guys went to iowa which you had posted a couple of different, if they weren't live, I think they were both live broadcasts that you guys posted of visiting the Sullivan's Museum. Yeah, I think I did a couple of live right while we were right in there, but I also did- I have um, no memory. <laughs> yeah, mean, did you do live? I, for my phone, yeah. I think I did a yeah. couple of live. Um, I mean, that was a absolutely amazing. <laughs> shout out to Nick. Actually, shout out to that whole yeah. staff there because okay. they went above and beyond for us. Um, I mean, we didn't just go to the the Grout Museum, but we went to we went to some guy's house. Like, oh yeah, Mike. This yeah, guy, this guy Mike, who has just this fantastic collection of the Sullivans. Um, just his own research. Yeah, his own research, like and we went to his house. I mean, that was like we didn't know we were doing that. We went to um, the school slash church that, yeah. that the Sullivan boys went to. So we do have video of that. Uh, unfortunately, the the building is. Yeah, but it's makes it cool. It makes it cool. But we do have video inside. We went inside whether we we're supposed to or not. Um, we went to the cemetery. Shane had his made right sandwich. Yeah. But the Grout Museum itself was amazing. I mean, we were looking at like letters and George Sullivan's hat and like all these things that we talk about but never see. So to actually see them in person, um, listening to the, a couple of the Sullivan's audio, um, Genevieve listening to their voices on audio. I mean, it was unbelievable. And that's one of the things that I think because the Sullivan story is so famous, we haven't captured that, but we're starting to capture that. Uh, that's, and this, this is something that we have that unfortunately many other museum ships don't have. Like, you, you know, the Midway or you know, Lady Lexington, they don't have another museum somewhere else that represents what they represent like the Sullivan's does. There's a whole another museum about the Sullivan's and it's a part of the larger, uh, larger museum as a whole because it's for all of Iowa and all veterans within Iowa, the state of Iowa. But I, I mean, now we have access to a lot of those resources that they have that we didn't have before, nor did we ever build that connection. So it was important. Well, and that's what I love about this story so much. And and I've I've mentioned it so many times in the past because as an outsider, you know, like myself, I find it uh interesting that museums, not all museums, but a lot of museums, don't have the tendency to communicate uh between each other. And so you guys by taking this road trip on all of a sudden you've made a connection that it sounds to me like is going to last a long time. And, and you, uh, you guys could make all kinds of future plans amongst each other. Yeah. And, you know, I am remiss, you know, like for the USS Barber or for John, for the Slater, it would be like having access to those family members and like their materials from the namesake. 
right? That doesn't always often, and certainly it would just destroyers or destroyer escorts, but it doesn't happen very often that a museum ship um, uh, can build a relationship with the namesake's family. But that might be something that I would, you know, certainly recommend throughout, uh, you know, if there's a way of uh, finding and communicating with the family of the namesake, you know, that would be, and that's kind of comparable to what we now have access to. You know, they have spent years cultivating a relationship with the Swenson family, who was the captain of the Juno. And so they have material from, you know, his second wife and, and letters that she was getting from all the family of, of the, you know, sailors on the Juno, not just the Sullivans. So for them cultivating, obviously, the Sullivan family, but now the Swenson family, that just opens the door for, you know, to build that story and to fill those gaps. And it's important for us to foster that relationship and it was thrilling that we were able to go. You know, of course, we, we met with Kelly Sullivan for about two hours and we caught her up with everything. And so it, uh, you know, trying to fill that gap of relationships that were not built her, here earlier. And it would be when it, Oh, I'm sorry, Shane. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I was going to ask, when it comes to the Edson, the 505, uh, the Sullivans, you know, this whole road trip leading up to getting over to Pearl Harbor, if you had to finish the sentence, I wish I had more time to visit X. Um, probably some of the other ships in San Francisco, I think, for me, like the Pampanito, the submarine, right? Yeah, there, you know, when we, we, when we got there, people that we developed relationships with said, oh, you were in California for two days? Well, you should have come up to Stockton, or you should have come up, you know, we talked about the Jeremiah O'Brien, we talked about the USS Lucid, and we just were, I mean, we went to the Hornet, and then we went to Pier 70, where the Sullivan's was constructed. Again, we have videos of that that will be coming out. Um, you know, but yeah, I would, I would probably agree with Stephen that, Although we did say it would have been nice to spend an extra day in Waterloo. Yeah, um, I actually that yeah I take that back. It would have been nice to do um, two days in Waterloo and one day in San Francisco, um, but it just didn't work out that way. Or or even one day in in Chicago, but unfortunately it didn't work out that way. Um, I did have a lot of fun in Waterloo. It was it was quite the adventure, quite the day. Maybe it was just the running around and doing all the things that we did. But I mean, I feel like we got so much accomplished in Iowa in such a short amount of time. And, you know, we were in Waterloo for, I don't know, seven hours. Yeah. Because so we didn't even stay in Waterloo. We drove to Des Moines after that to fly to San Francisco. Oh, guys, and we were shot by that time. And we didn't take a wrong turn, but we were driving through cornfields at like 1030 at night. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. I got a little stressed out that night because what was I saying? Like, those are the country roads that people will die on, you know, because people <laughs> blow through stop signs and we didn't really know the, obviously we don't know the area, but it was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that was because we had to get from Des Moines. So we left Chicago, did uh, Waterloo, then drove to Des Moines for a six o'clock flight to San Francisco. We didn't arrive <laughs> until 1130 or midnight into Des Moines. So we slept for three hours and then had to get back up again and get right to the airport for our flight to San Fran. So, yeah, San, I mean, San Francisco was, I think by that time, by the time we got to San Francisco, we were kind of like planning out our day. I know we did um, a live video. That's when we did yeah. it live. So I think we, we did a full Well, and you had, you had bad weather in San Francisco too. The first day it was, okay. we were going to, we were going to try to do something, but then, you know, it was like raining and, we, you know, talked about Pier 70, but we're not going to take that camera out, you know, in, in that sort of rain that was there. So we just kind of, we said that that would be a nice day just to lay low and uh, just to kind of try and catch our breath. So, and, and if I'm not mistaken, your, 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 uh, your phone chain uh, doesn't have a camera. Is that right? Yes, that is correct, sir. I didn't think so. Yeah. For those of you that aren't aware, um, <laughs> hey, well, we didn't chains. Shane's phone is ridiculously primitive. Um, I, I've never seen anything like it. I hope I don't see anything like it again. But is it a yeah, flip it, phone? He, 
And I don't. Like I don't know. Paper. Did like, you say light phone, John? No. Is it a flip phone? Oh no, it's not a flip phone, but it's called light phone. So light it's, phone. Okay. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, I know. What uh, makes John, it even uh, better is that I lost my phone for two days, so we had no phone for two days. And right. We, he can't. We can't call an Uber. We can't. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's many other things. You know. So, yeah. And I apologize to Stephen about. You know that say, oh, I'm sorry, we're relying on your technology, but uh, you know, I mean, we, we should also talk about the dinner we had in Chicago. We went with Tino. Oh, Tino's, that was great. Yeah, we went to e first time Tino's in... East or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I think it's... First time I had uh, Chicago style pizza. Yeah. And being from downstate in New York, um, you know, we like to trash any other pizza that's not New York pizza. And uh, I was sadly mistaken. Chicago pizza is fantastic. Yeah, that was good. It was absolutely. Oh yeah, it was it was really good. I I I loved having dinner with you guys too. It was a lot of fun. Good. Um, when uh, so um, I got a couple of questions about Hawaii, and and the last time we did a live broadcast, you had mentioned that, or at least you were prepared to be peppered with questions about the uh, the Sullivans. Um, Anything ranging from, you know, how did it happen? How did you guys get it floating again? I mean, so did that happen? Did you got were you guys kind of the center of attention for a while? I didn't feel like we were the center of attention at all, actually. Um, and that was nice. Um, was the, the topic of conversation in, um, you know, over drinks or dinner or whatever? Yeah, but I mean, it, it wasn't ever, I mean, everybody was cool about it yeah it was like i did i did uh steven and i did discuss maybe on the second day of the conference it's like they're saying stuff but they're not using us as the example when clearly we are but what happened was we did the first day we had a four-hour presentation from a company that is an expert in corrosion and when i was talking to uh jonathan who's the executive director or president of the iowa um, the LA, you know, I, I think the website is LA Battleship, I believe it is. Uh, he said we brought them on that four hour presentation because of what happened to the Sullivans. And so I had a lot of sidebar conversations with a lot of people. People would come up to us individually while we were having a bagel in the morning or something. Yeah. And being like, oh, tell me more about this. Or, but it wasn't a group thing. It was, we had multiple people over the three days you know, want a sidebar with us kind of thing. And I never got the feeling that it was anything negative or anything. Yeah. And, you know, I think it, it brought to some people and, and I could be wrong, but like that preservation is important. Um, and that the Sullivan's was a good example of why we so desperately need to preserve these ships that aren't supposed to last 80 years. They're supposed to last 20 years, 30 years. Um, and, you know, they haven't been upkept like the Sullivan hasn't been upkept by the Navy since 1965. Um, so we have a maintenance team of a handful of guys that are great, but it's not a, a Navy maintenance that are constantly working on the ships. Um, so I think it really pushed preservation to the forefront. Um, but again, it wasn't, I never got anything from anybody or even the feeling like, oh, there's the Sullivan's guys or anything like that. Um, it was nothing but positivity, really. Yeah, and I think Stephen hit the nail on the head. It was used, the Sullivan's was used as an example to say, this will happen to every other ship out there, right? And mm -hmm. what we do now, and to learn from the Sullivan's, so yeah, really using us as an example Certainly, the Laffey was in a bad in a bad way in a bad spot a few years ago. Uh, so it just reinvigorates the need for a cyclical volunteer program, maintenance program. You know, I know that I'm using the word cyclical, but you know, I'm trying to find out find the other word. Uh, but you know, like a regimented schedule of maintenance, preservation, and it all goes together, right? We're not doing much restoring, except for John said they're doing restoring. Uh, but 
you know, preservation, conservation, maintenance, and, you know, getting into those areas that we sometimes can forget, you know, because we're walking by the ship every day or walking on the ship every day. Those, those areas that we can just forget about sometimes is just as important as the ones that are on the tour route. So, and Shane mentioned the, uh, the four hour presentation, which was on the first day of presentation. And it was long, but it was unbelievably informative and thinking of things that I personally never thought of, not that I'm an expert in any way whatsoever, but just, um, the little things that you could do to, to preserve the ship that you don't even think of, like even just tiny little things that are going to help here and there. Um, such as, uh, one of the things that, um, you know, a lot of these ships, we put the, uh, the non-skid paint on it or the non-skid non mats. And that can actually hide like corrosion underneath it if, if it's not done properly, which is one of the things that I thought of because we use non-skid paint all the time, mm -hmm. which is essential in Buffalo weather. Um, mm -hmm. So you, little tiny things that I personally don't think of. It's also why I'm not in charge of maintenance or anything like that. But things like that like would come up and I'm like, oh, you know what? That makes sense. Well, and, and I don't know how many times John's mentioned it on the Slater, but, you know, ships rust from the inside. <clears throat> and he stressed many times cleaning of the bilges is one of the biggest things you can do to make sure that these things remain floating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know, but in the early 2000s, Slater used to flood Shaft Alley because we had a leak. Um, not a lot of water, but at one point... I believe it was port side shaft alley actually flooded into one of our engine rooms. And then we finally got down there and, you know, fix, fix the, the leak around the, the, the shaft and repainted it. Now it's great, but um, yeah, if, if you don't do it from the inside, you're going to get leaks. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, you know, one of the biggest maintenance projects that I think is going on right now. And you said that this was also addressed during the Hinsa conference. They, who, who made the presentation or a presentation about the battleship Texas? That was Travis. I, 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 I can't remember his last name offhand, but uh, he's, he's, you know, he was intricate in every aspect of uh, the dry docking preparation, you know, so he was the right guy to do the presentation. So uh, we've, we've talked to him a couple of times before the conference about how things were going and we want to use him as, as a, you know, as a facilitator for us and, uh, and not a, a consultant per se, but he says that I'll be willing to come up to Buffalo, talk to your staff, talk to the project team, the management team about your dry docking. So again, as Steven said, uh, that really helpful uh, behavior or, you know, that camaraderie. What did they have to say or present to you guys about what was going on? Because at the time, let's see, if I'm not mistaken, the Texas was lifted out of the water, I think at the very end of August. And so you guys were there maybe in Hawaii, maybe like 10 days, not quite two weeks later. What did they have to present at that particular point about uh, what was going on with the Texas? Thank you, Candace. Uh, and oh, Travis probably, Davis with a yeah, okay. And I kind of knew I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I said, well, I think his last name kind of rhymes with his first name. So, but I couldn't, Travis Davis, but I couldn't put it together. Um, thanks, Candace. And thank you to everyone who's commenting. I'm sorry, we're just kind of focused on the four of us here, but you guys are having a lot of good comments. And um, thank you, Sam, for uh, saying st stuff. Candace, and I met Candace at the at Hinza. She's a staff member at um, Texas. Yeah, 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 right. And so oh, she, no kidding. So yeah, she's the one listening. Um, yeah, look at that beautiful, look at those beautiful pictures. I tell you that. So well, and, and for anyone that's, that, that wants to learn more about the Battleship Texas, please visit battleshiptexas.org, www.battleshiptexas.org, because that's where these pictures come from. It's, you know, I mean, they're fantastic photos that they're posting on the website, and, and that's great. But there's a lot of 
I don't know. The whole thing's fat. Like if I click on this next, what's what 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 was involved in getting this thing out of the water? Uh, you know, it's a it's a monumental task. They had to float a a floating dry dock okay. into into Galveston to lift it out. Here's a picture. So it's finally out of the water. That's impressive. But then the work that's going on, they're they're cutting holes into the torpedo blister you know, as, as part of this project, but I don't think they were doing this at the time that you guys were in Hawaii. So what, what were they talking about when you were there? Well, they were talking about what they were going to be doing and what the cost of that was. So I think he threw out the number 22 million. Uh, and then they had a list of about five or six things that they wanted to accomplish. Uh, one of them. Now this foam, he really talked about. So what you're seeing uh, and everyone's seeing is the foam and they're using water jets so they're not using any fire at all on the torpedo blisters or anywhere below the water line it's water jets with granite uh you know ground up granite and you're putting that i don't even know the pounds per square inch or the pressure per square inch but and it's cutting right through the steel they're going to be removing that foam about seven hundred and fifty thousand gallons of foam that they had on. wow um, and, and that was just to help that nine hour, uh, I think it was about nine hours to dry dock. So they put all that foam in there just to give it that little extra, uh, security while she was going to dry dock. And then it was immediately going to be removed. But as you can see, oh, no the kidding. so the, fo the foam was just a temporary measure to get it, yes. uh, over to where the dry dock was. So the foam wasn't there for decades if, if you will inside the torpedo it was just a temporary measure yeah i mean the temper i think they okay. added the foam last year or maybe a year and a half ago uh so it was temporary in terms of it was you know helping to protect the ship throughout this past year year and a half but you can see the framing the longitudinal framing you can see the lightning holes in that picture uh and you can just mm -hmm. see again the degradation uh you know, you know, along the baffles there, along the side. And you can even look through the cut hole. You can see the other lightning hole right there. So they're doing a complete rework of all of that framing, the stanchion work. Yeah. And, and for those of you that aren't aware, the battleship Texas, I think, well, definitely prior to World War II, but I want to say it was, might have been at the end of the 20s, beginning of the 30s, these torpedo blisters were added to the starboard and port sides of the hull and they're removing this and what they're finding is all kinds of rust and corrosion underneath again another picture from uh battleshiptexas.org uh i mean it's yeah, it's amazing at what they're doing yeah those torpedo blisters i think were added in 24 and that was the technology at the time uh mm -hmm. and but yeah they they even said when the when Travis had mentioned when it went to uh, to become a museum ship, even back in 1946, they had at least 10 feet of water in their torpedo blister mm. back then. Wow! And there was not much work done. Uh, very basic maintenance measures up until about 1983, and then from 1983 on they had really focused on getting her uh you know conserved and preserved in the proper way but from 46 to 83 they didn't do very much uh and i think that's the way it was set up with the texas with the commission uh in the state of texas uh you know they could only dedicate a certain amount of money to the preservation of this so i don't want to keep blabbing on and on about this if you please john and stephen if you have more you know, add. Well, I, I see John answered William's question, you know, will, will the torpedo blisters be rebuilt? As I understand it, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, the <clears throat> short answer is yes, but the long answer is they're, they're going to be replaced with something a little bit lower profile, and maybe Candace can even throw in an answer as well. Uh, uh, what do you know, John? Uh, really, all I know is, uh, is just a, a new version is being installed. Yeah. I don't know any specifics. Mm hmm. Um, well, I think what I'm going to try and do is whether it's Candace or Travis, possibly the 
the next episode of Museum Ship Mafia, the uh, next live event that we do, I'll see if I can't get someone from the Battleship Texas to join us and give us an update a little bit more in depth than just the 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 conversation we're having about it because I think the whole thing is fascinating. Uh, you know, not only the work that they're doing, but even just what it took to get it there, uh, even to raise the funds to do this, I think it's just a fan fa fascinating story. Yeah, uh, I have. I could get you Travis's, or if Candace is still on, I, I don't know if she. But you know, if you want to give your, uh, I do have Travis's uh, email. I could send that to you. Oh, well, fantastic! Or you, you know, that. Candace, or if anyone's watching, you know, I'm easy to get a hold of. History X Channel at gmail.com. You know, shoot me an email. I'd love to, you know, have someone on from the Battleship Texas. Well. <clears throat> There yeah. was, and William just asked a question, was there any truth to the story about they did have concrete on the main deck, which they pulled up, I believe, in 1983 when they started formalizing a restoration and, or a preservation and conservation plan. That was one of the first things they did. But probably from 46 to 83, there was slab, you know, poured concrete on the main deck. No kidding. And that, and, and that wouldn't, well, I, obviously I'm sure they didn't put so much on there to compromise the center of gravity, but anytime I'd hear about concrete on the main deck, I just think that that would just totally ruin the center of gravity, but I guess not. Well, we do have all, you know, for our emergency measures, we do have concrete, you know, Stephen and I have both talked about you know, the four foot gash on one side. We have another gash on port side that has been temporarily sealed with concrete. Now, if you have a driveway and it's concrete, you know what happens? It's porous. It will eventually mm -hmm. crack and water, you know, just can intrude everywhere. So it's a temporary measure uh, that, but I don't know what their goal was when they put the concrete on the main deck. Was it a, was it their permanent solution? You know, weather's a little different down there, but uh, you know, for us up north, we know what happens to side, you know, sidewalks there and driveways that are concrete. So. Uh, I just glanced at the clock and we've already been talking for about an hour. So <laughs> what, <laughs> I, I mean, I've got so many more questions, but at the, at, at, at the same time, it's like, I know I need to cut this off because where you guys are, it's 9 PM. Um, what, I guess just say like wrap up comments about the hints of conference, anything else that you feel that, that we, that we would want to know. Uh, the flight home from Hawaii sucks. <laughs> I mean, guys, that is, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, we did, uh, we left at 7 a.m. That was very nice, though. We didn't get a lay when we landed, but we did get a send-off. So I wonder if they do that at every gate. Like, they've got the uh, ukulele players, and there was a dancer. And so as we're entering on to the plane uh, on the jet ram or whatever those things are called. I don't think it's called that. Okay. <laughs> what is it? But then they had like a band wishing us goodbye, which was which was a nice uh, which was a nice touch because they uh, they recognized you as and... as being Shane and Stephen from the Buffalo Naval Park. It was specifically just for us. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, but okay. yeah, I mean, it was great to see. You know, it was great to see Tim and Shanna, and you know, you guys uh, were awarded uh, really nice awards uh, from. Uh, Naval History and Heritage Command and Hinza, uh, well deserved. Uh, the Cass and Young, you know, there are others, but uh, you know, well deserved for you guys. And uh, yeah, just look forward to next year. I really look forward to Albany. You know, I, I'm well, that's I'm, what I wanted to get to. It's like, okay, so the last the last little bit that I want to okay, cover yeah. is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't think it's really been announced, is that the next. Hinsa conference is actually going to be in Albany at the USS Slater. Yeah, it's going to be the first time the Slater's ever hosted it. Um, yeah. It's a little nerve wracking because it's a lot of planning, but hey, Shanna's really good at what she does. So uh, <laughs> she has uh, about 10 months or give or take to do all the work. So good luck to her. And take care of the walrus. Yeah, yeah. We've already got him, uh, got a few photographs with, with, with uh, Wally. Yeah, it's a lot um, closer. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, that, that you yeah, know, Stephen's right. It's 7 a.m. in Hawaii, five hour flight to San Francisco, four hour layover in San Francisco, red eye to New York City. Now it's eight o'clock in the morning the next day, then an hour flight to Buffalo. We were, you know, I did, even though you might make fun of my phone. I think I left it on the plane and we were walking out and I had to turn around and I said, Oh my God. So I had to run to one of the flight attendants. Why, why, why did you have to turn around and go get it? <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah and, what? uh, yeah, you know, all my content. Maybe it's just time for a new phone, Shane. You know? Oh, buddy. Come on. Love it. <laughs> I'm too connected. Anyway, anyway but, uh, yeah, really look forward to Albany. Um, you guys you know, going to sleep on the ship, right? Yeah. Well, is, is that going to be an option? Yeah. Are you uh, for, for the Hinsa <clears throat> conference? Are you going to have people or availability yeah. on the ship for people to stay? Yeah. Yeah. Officers country can fit 15. You got captain's cabin. You got chiefs. Uh, and then we have oh, two cool. full I'll take birthing captain's order. cabin. Ah, 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 yeah. No, I, well, that, you're, a poly, you're, you're a polywog, you know, so you haven't been no, no. to the conference yet. You're a polywog. Yeah. All, all, joke, all joking aside, um, yeah, I will take the captain's cabin. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that's going to be reserved for um, uh, for Ryan. Probably Ryan oh. or Janet, you yeah. know. Uh, but, yeah, Ken, we'd love to see, you know, I mean, I don't want to speak for anyone else. You know, I don't want to invite you to where, you know, it's really the Slater's job. But it would be nice to have you and, uh, you know, there next year. Oh, I, I'd love it. I actually, I'd love to fly into Buffalo and then do a road trip with you guys over to Albany. Oh man. Are you sure about that? No, well, actually, no, I guess not. You should um, have heard some of the music that we were listening to on our drive <laughs> on the first track there. It was uh, pretty, it's pretty fun. Well, let's, <laughs> let's wrap this up. Cause like I said, we've gone over the hour. Uh, USS Slater, Albany, New York, John Epp curator. Uh, what a, uh, what do you got coming up to close out the season? I know next week you said you've got your, your last fundraiser. Uh, if anyone wants to learn more about that, where, what, what can they visit? Where should they go to learn more? Yeah. So uh, more immediately, if anyone is in the area, like tomorrow, we have, we're, we'll have a little ceremony in the morning at 10 AM. Uh, it's the Navy's birthday. Uh, next Thursday is our annual fundraiser. Uh, it's, it's kind of an invite only type deal, but um that's where we uh, we raise a ton of money to fund our our projects and uh, get us through the winter when we're closed. Uh, and then we we will be closing up for the season the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and we'll open back up the first Wednesday of April next year. Yeah, so that's wow. interesting. Our our schedule shifts. You know, we're like a so we open in late March and then we close the week before Thanksgiving. Hmm. Though I have a curator tour on that Black Friday. Uh, to, to try and capture people who come in from out of town to visit their family. Um, yeah, please, everybody, even if you can't go to Albany, contribute, donate for their annual fundraiser. We had a really good one this year. Uh, we raised a, some good funds, uh, but we always, you know, wow, okay, we raised $53,000 at our fundraiser, but moving something's going to cost, you know, 800000 Yeah, right, $800,000 mm -hmm. or whatever. So, even though it seems like and it, it is people are really contributing, make sure you support the Slater, you know, join uh, Ken's History X channel, uh, you know, member. Well, and let you, you, you touch you actually touch on a really good point. You know, even though the Slater is killing it right now on YouTube, they just monetize. They can always use more subscribers. And like I always say, it is not only one of the easiest, but also one of the most effective ways that you can support the YouTube channel check out their videos, give them views, but also just simply click and subscribe. So if you've never checked out the Slater's YouTube channel previously, they've got a fantastic video up there right now showing that engine startup. Uh, just do a simple YouTube search for USS Slater. It'll take you right to it. And, and you'll probably watch the video two or three times at least like I did. So uh, a lot of good contact, uh, content on the USS Slater. Uh, when it comes to Shane, Stephen, uh, what's what's in store for the end of the season for the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park? A nap. Yeah. Okay. A nap. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> encampments. He's been talking about his encampments. 
Uh, we're doing a Veterans Day ceremony. Uh, we're doing a, a Halloween, you know, ship and treat or something it's called. Uh, ship or treat. Yeah, we're actually, that's pretty, um, that's something we're doing this year where kids will get their uh, trick or treat on the ships, which I'm really mm -hmm. excited about. That's another thing I've been planning since I got back. Um, but we're going to get to the videos as well. We have a lot of videos. It's a lot of work. Steven's been up against it with the, but I know we're, 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 we're still knowing that the schedule for all of those films that we took. You'll have Edson part two this week. I promise people. I promise. And then I'm really looking forward to the Sullivans, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you know, um, Ralph that, Wilson Jr. Day. If anyone who knows who that is, we do celebrate his, uh, we did get a Go Bills comment. We did get a Go Bills. Go Bills. From Eric, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Ralph Go Wilson. Sabres. Ralph Wilson Jr. was the <laughs> owner of the Bills for a long time, but I mean, we have a, a display for him, an exhibit, and uh, we do celebrate him here because he was in the Army. Maybe. 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 Lieutenant Commander of a Minesweeper. There you go. Well, and what I just said for the USS Slater also stands for the Buffalo Neary County Naval and Military Park check out their videos uh if you haven't already done so subscribe like their channel it's a huge boost uh to all of us and so yeah uh who is this diver dan navy vet liking and commenting on the videos helps the youtube al algorithm as well 100 percent correct so you know subscribe to these channels definitely but also uh give them views it's, it's a great way to just bring exposure to both museums and and I can't say it enough. It's one of the uh, simplest but most effective ways to throw your support behind their efforts. Uh, USS Slater and the Buffalo Naval Park. Hey, Ken, do you want to mention, Ken, I'm sorry, do you want to mention real quick any of the people for guest appearances that might be coming up over the next couple of months? Well, I don't have anything locked in yet. So all I'll say is uh, stay tuned to, you know, you can check out uh, the Museum Ship Mafia Facebook page um, on all three channels. Now that the Slater is over a thousand subscribers, you guys, the Slater can now start posting on its community tab. So when we get news of the next guest that we'll have on, like I said, I'd like to have someone from the Battleship Texas, but whoever we get for next month, you'll start to see notifications. Uh, so check out Museum Ship Naf Mafia Facebook page and uh, last but not least, I just want to um, apologize to Ryan Szymanski. We really wanted to have him on tonight. We just simply ran out of time. So Ryan, hopefully we'll be able to have some time in the future to get you on. Our apologies to Ryan Szymanski from the Battleship New Jersey. Uh, let's see. With that being said, anything else that I may have forgotten, guys? Uh, I don't think so. All right. All right. Well, my name's Ken Stano from the YouTube channel History X. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us, and keep an eye out for notifications on our next live broadcast. It's been great having you guys with us. And Let's with see that Aaron's said, comment. Well, what do we got? What do we got? Uh, it'd be great to get someone from the USS Kid on. I don't know. Do we know anyone from the Kid? <laughs> Yeah, yeah <laughs> Maybe. We'll, we'll have we'll have Parks we'll have Parks Stevenson on. As we all know, he is now the or he's involved with the USS Kid. I'm not sure if he's the director or what his title is, but we'll uh, uh, ha uh, have him on once he gets settled. You're talking to a, talking about a busy guy right now who's moving from California to Louisiana and settling into a new position. But once we can uh, once we know that he's settled in at the Kid, we'll definitely have Parks Stevenson back on. Um, uh, any other comments that I may have missed, John? I think you're good. Oh, yeah. Tim Nesmith from The Kid is a really good guy to have on. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Andy says, yeah. Our hoist says, yeah, I would love to have Tim on as mm -hmm. well. He's just, you know, he's been there for 20 years or something. You know, he's a yep. wealth of knowledge as well. So, and there's a Slater, you know, the Slater and The Kid have a good connection. So, you know, yeah, our director was the director of the kid before he came to the Slater. Yeah. Um, and then, but yeah, I I forgot that, Shane. Yeah. Shane. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then I was trading, um, messages with, uh, Brian from the, uh, Galveston Naval Museum as well. So it's, it's really interesting 
how many people have contacted us that really would like to be part of the Museum Ship Mafia for future broadcasts. So stay tuned. Uh, occasionally check out Museum Ship Mafia on Facebook. You'll see some notifications and updates on there. Um, anything else? Have a good evening, guys. All right, guys. Well, with that being said, again, I'm Ken Stano from the YouTube channel History X. Hope everyone enjoyed the broadcast tonight. We'll see you in the month. And in the meantime, hope everyone has a great evening.